and welcome back to yet another week of Behind the Lens. I'm Debbie Elias, film critic, creator, and host of Behind the Lens, where we go behind the lens and below the line with those movers and shakers, the film and TV makers, the producers, the directors, writers, actors, cinematographers, editors, composers, production designers, costume designers, sound mixers, sound editors, sound designers, VFX magicians, and so many more. And we've been doing a lot of talking lately, but there's more coming at you because we are now in full-blown awards season, as well as post-strike season. So, a lot more availability of talent has come up, and I'm taking advantage of all that I can get for all of you out there. Now, in addition to awards season, we're also in ho-ho-ho season. That's right. Christmas is coming. It's only five weeks away. And what better way to get in the mood than with holiday films? And of course, Santa. Now, first, I want to apologize again to all of our listeners about last week's total debacle. Let's just face it. The show was a total debacle as while on the air... I discovered we had no phone system in the entire Adrenaline Radio building. I'm still uncertain as to the specific cause for this, but Big Nick, studio owner Nick, has been working on the problem, but until I'm satisfied that the problem is totally rectified and won't happen again, uh... I'm pre-recording today's show for you. I apologize. We were going to have live guests calling in. Um, They have been moved to December. Um, So to give Nick time to get this whole phone situation squared away. So that you can listen uninterrupted, without delays, and without the shenanigans that happen with live, anything. But, I am pre-recording today's show for you with two fabulous pre-recorded exclusive one-on-one interviews with two incredible filmmakers. And we're going to be talking about Santa Claus. Who else for the holidays? First up, you're going to hear in just a moment my exclusive interview with the director and executive producer of the Santa Clauses, now in season two, Jason Weiner. Jason is a dream. He has been with the Santa Clauses since the first season. And as to be expected, and this comes as no surprise to anybody, the show picks up where the, where the film le- franchise leaves off and embraces everything about the films and brings in beloved characters. Of course, we have Tim Allen, Elizabeth Mitchell, Elizabeth Allen Dick, Austin Kane, Matilda Lawler, and Devin Bright returning for season two of the series. We also have a few film favorites that are popping up in season two. How about a visit from Cupid and Sandman and the Easter Bunny? Season one We had Bernard back. There's no such thing as too much Bernard in my book. Just just putting that out there for Jason and the powers that be at Disney. But now, in season two, the Calvin family has gone back to the North Pole. Scott Calvin has gotten rid of the ridiculous idea that he is no longer going to be Santa Claus. uh, And has come out of his short retirement. Uh, But now... We have another problem. Mad Santa. Yes, there is a Mad Santa that now appears on the scene. He has been encased as a nutcracker for centuries for his bad deeds. But I have to wonder, was Mad Santa on his own naughty list? Hmm, that question hasn't been answered yet. But when you watch the series, you might find out. At the same time... 
Poor Scott, he's trying to train Calvin to become a successor Santa when he does retire. Because as you'll recall from season one, Charlie is now happily settled, married, and he's not interested in being Santa at this point. Who knows? Charlie could change his mind if we get to season three. But the, the series, it's fabulous. It is fun. It is light and bright. There is some dark. There are some darker notes in here, uh, which you're going to hear Jason and I talk about. So rather than me keep plathering on about the Santa Claus's season two, take a listen to my exclusive interview with the wonderful director and executive producer of the Santa Claus's season two, Jason Weiner. Hey, Jason. Hello. Hi, how are you? Good, I feel like I'm talking to a relative. <laughs> I am so happy to hear that, but I'm also so happy that you that we have a season two of the Santa Clauses, because Christmas came early for me when I binge-watched this uh, last week. I love to hear that. I love it. You're amongst the very first people to have seen the whole thing, so I, I love hearing that. It is absolutely fantastic and fun. I emailed to Kelsey. I think I said sleigh bells are ringing for this one. That's what we were going for. We had a ball making it. And, you know, my goal is always, especially with a comedy, to try and put fun on screen. And I think we, I think we pulled it off this time. You really did. Season one was perfect, grounded, funny. But you really upped the ante with season two. And that's what really impressed me. And you didn't let it stagnate. You have the scripts are tight. We get to see growth in the characters. You know, Tim Allen is always going to be Santa and Scott. And there's no really changing him. He's so set in his ways. So you very smartly, we get to see Cal and Sandra. Their game gets up, upped. They're dealing with issues that teenagers would deal with, but on an elevated level because of magical Santa powers that come from being the children of Santa at the North Pole. And I love what you have them dealing with and coming into their own and finding their own path. And this is yeah. where La Bufana really comes into play with the Sandra storyline and yep. that is so grounded in real life i think everybody out there girls in particular they always had a very special aunt you know there's a reason you have grandparents and aunts i mean you're getting you're getting all the sort of that that's really the fun of this of this franchise and this series is getting to do real relatable real world stories hidden inside of this larger than life legend of Santa Claus and the North Pole. That really comes through, Jason. And that I found I was really pleasantly surprised to see that. Because so often when you get into the second or third season of something, you're still kind of looking at the same thing overall. And this is why a lot of shows don't go beyond one season or maybe two, because they stagnate and they're not relatable because as your audience gets older, you've got to grow. The show has to grow with the audience. Yep. And you really handle that so well here. But that then begs the question. Season one ends. It's a huge success. Everybody clamoring for season two. I was clamoring as soon as I binge watched before it was released season one. I was yelling I wanted season two. Now I'm yelling I want season three. Um, how do you top and build on the movies that came before the first season of the series? Because you tie the film history in exceedingly well, too. We get some beloved characters back. We get to the climactic episodes at the end of the season. And, of course, we we hear more about our beloved Bernard and Curtis. And Charlie gets shout-outs. So how do you build 
on a legend and still make it fresh and up the ante? Well, I mean, good storytelling comes from, I think, genuine inspiration. And I think that it, it, it didn't feel like a job, like we have to do another season. It felt like, you know what? As goofy and wild as this world is, we're all having a ball and feeling inspired by it. And I think, you know, we got a little inspiration from the first season when a joking reference to the Mad Santa, which admittedly was a little bit of a, a, of a Game of Thrones parody joke, mm -hmm. was really picked up on by the audience. The audience was like, oh, the Ma you know, it's Betty looking into the crystal that tells her the darkest time of the North Pole was during the reign of the Mad Santa, she mentions. And again, it was a little bit of a throwaway, but the audience really responded to it, wondering who the Mad Santa was and whether we would get to meet him. Um, and it stuck in, in both my imagination and Jack's imagination. And um, simultaneously, Eric Stone Street had reached out to both of us saying that he was obsessed with the first season. He watched it with his, his uh, soon-to-be stepsons. And he um, just had an amazing, and, and he's always wanted to be to play sort of in the world of Santa. Uh, so we had Eric in mind, knowing that he was a fan, um, and kind of created this this new villain for the second season around him. And the key to it, and the key to upping the ante in the second season, was creating the Mad Santa as a kind of more formidable opposing force mm -hmm. that he had in the first season. And Eric had a ball creating the character because his goal was to create the kind of like funny, formidable, a little bit scary, but also oddly lovable, classic Disney villain like Cruella DeVille. Yes. That kids don't know quite whether they want to hug or run away from. And and I think he really he really towed that line and helped us raise the ante both on the comedy of the second season and also the kind of um, stakes. Well, the comedy, especially when we're talking about Eric and his portrayal of Mad Santa, because... Yeah. It's now 700 years later, and he is in a world he does not know. So, so much of the comedy just comes from that fish-out-of-water aspect. Yeah, it's really fun. But then you, of course, you, his, his dynamic with Gabriel Iglesias, such funny, sort of innocent character, and Chris Kringle Moreno, that's his, his name, and, and he owns a Santa-themed amusement park called Santopolis. It, it, like, but, but again... Chris is a, is a character you recognize insofar as we all have a, a relative or a friend that is just like totally obsessed with Christmas yep. as, an, as an adult. And, 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 and Gabriel Iglesias sort of represents that guy, which is funny, but also real and relatable, yep. like we said at the beginning. Watching Eric and Gabriel play off of each other, yeah. ha casting Gabriel as Chris... So yeah. smart with him playing against Eric because it's Chris's joviality and pure joy and love of That's Christmas right. that softens the villainy of Mad Santa. That's right. Because I think if we didn't have Chris, I think Mad Santa would have been a little darker than we would expect from a family-friendly Disney Christmas Santa movie. That's right. And then you have, I mean, if Chris is the angel on his shoulder, you have the devil on his shoulder in, in his sidekick, Gnome, <laughs> played by Marta, Marta Kessler as Olga. <laughs> she is hilarious. So funny, right? Hilarious. Her little Russian accent, it, it's just so, it's so perfect. It, she's, she's, she's so funny as a, as a, as a sidekick and and frankly, comedy partner to, to Eric. There, it, it's so funny to you know say that Eric, as a grown man, has like comedic chemistry with this eleven-year-old girl, but he absolutely does. They're yeah. just so funny together. Well, and that's something that really stands out in this second series of the Santa Claus in the second season of the Santa Clauses is, is that the pairings. We have a lot of comedy duos that are really yeah. blossoming and going forward. Tim gets to be 
Tim is standalone in terms of comedy. He's there, and everybody else is just around him. But then we really get to see things. You know, we have Betty and Noel are expanded this year, even though, you know, we miss Betty for a couple of episodes. Although we don't really miss her, thanks to Noel's obsession with Betty. We've got Olga and Mad Santa. We've got Sandra really embracing a friendship and an aunt niece relate dynamic with La Bufana. Right. It, it really, and then we've got Carol, who's desperately trying to help Gary. Carol and Gary are unsung uh, as a comedy team. Oh. They are really funny together. That uh, that kid who plays Gary is hysterical <sighs> and really found that character, really kind of invented that character. And, and the writers just have so much fun writing that dynamic with Carol and Gary. And then the way that you have had, that you've shot this, Jason, the scene where... He's eating a crusted thing of pudding out of the trash. And your editing is so sharp that we immediately see Carol's face. And so much of what we get from Elizabeth Mitchell, we get a lot of reactive shots to things that are going on around her. And she is very facially expressive as a comedian. Yeah, and Elizabeth Mitchell, I mean... From the beginning, a really unsung hero of of the franchise. Uh, she's so so warm and so lovable, and we've actually had a, a tremendous amount of fun in the second season getting her angry a little bit. Yeah, you know what I mean. And that's actually a theme of her between her and Sandra that that you know it's okay to express yourself, to express your emotions, and and that's that's one of the sort of hopefully relatable parenting themes that are in here. Every mother-daughter in the world is going to be able to relate to that as they think back on their lives, either in that moment or in the past, that, yep, I get it. I've been there, done that. Yeah. So, I mean, you tapped into everything that is relatable in the real world. And the fact that Santa's family faces the same kind of challenges and issues that the rest of us do. Right. That kind of makes it okay, because it's Santa. That's right. And yeah, the whole goal here is to make the show really fun for parents to watch with their kids. Yeah. There's lots of stuff, I think, these days out there where, you know, you turn on the TV and it's good for the kids, but, you know, as the parents... I can say this as the father of, of a five-year-old and a three-year-old. You know, it kind of makes, kind of makes your eyes bleed. To, uh, you're, you got you got to be on your phone. Whereas, whereas, hopefully, with this show, there's a ton for the parents to laugh at, the parents to get invested in. Um, whether it's whether it's the music or or the subtly sophisticated jokes coming from Jack Bird at you know the creator of Thirty Rock, along with his team. Um, that are that that are providing this really special tone. Of course, everything is in there for the kids almost intrinsically. You have you know the the magical world, the elves, Santa. Kids are going to want to watch this, but the trick really is making it fun for the parents too. Yeah, and you absolutely do. I mean, the dialogue, so many double entendres, very tongue in cheek, yeah. and I was roaring. I was laughing myself silly as I'm watching this. And, you know, yes, little kids are not going to get it, but parents are definitely going to pick up on the humor. That's right. And I just think that's spectacular. I, um, I try and do, I have my own directorial flourishes that are, um, that are aimed at the parents recognizing, uh, most particularly... Um, you know, as Jack sort of shared with me in the early going that he really wanted to delve into the history of the North Pole with the second season, um, I thought to myself, well, what's the greatest, the greatest sequel ever that dives into the history of the subject matter? And that's The Godfather Part Two. Mm -hmm. so I, I took a lot of stylistic elements from The Godfather Part Two and used them here in the North Pole. So all the flashbacks uh, do the same slow dissolve uh, so it's from and it, it, the contrasting one relevant modern image with a, uh, a, a contrasting relevant historical image and I, I, I the, the, the score is intended to evoke the God 
Godfather 2, all of the design of the North Pole, um, when we flash back to it in that era, is in, a, because, because we're really telling an immigrant story with the yeah. elves having migrated from Europe to the North Pole, um, we designed it to look like Ellis Island, all of their, all of their tattered clothes and, and, uh, the look of the encampment that we flash back to is all intended to evoke in the parents watching, whether they recognize it sort of, uh, you know, consciously or not. Uh, it's the Godfather part two, which, you know, frankly, parroting other films and film styles is another thing that is subtly a, a, a building block of this franchise. There's all kinds of those things going back to say like, the big slow motion football sequence in the in the second movie, you know, that's parodying like the longest yard. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? So, so they, they, there there are they, there's like a history within this franchise of, of referencing um, other other elements of pop culture, and that's what we were doing here with the Godfather Part Two. And I think you did a beautiful job with that. And also, what it lets you do the directorial flourishes that I really love. From a technical standpoint, I love that you've incorporated slow-mo. I love we get more of a, it's almost a sepia tone almost, just because of the production yeah, yeah. design. <clears throat> but your use of dissolves. It's so rare. We don't see that in television. We don't yeah, see I mean, things really, like that. But kind of what's cool about this, too, is like this is a hybrid. You know, yeah. there's some people that... You know, uh, in, online trolls complain, why isn't this a movie? And we're like, well, the kind of limited streaming series, there's elements of that that basically is the movie business now. Yeah. So, so that's what this is. It's kind of a hybrid. It, it, it's really a movie broken up into six episodes to enjoy with the family over the holidays. That's kind of what it is. And, and we're embracing that as kind of a new storytelling format. Taking advantage, I think, of the episodic structure, but also telling a propulsive story that makes you want to keep watching through the end. Absolutely. But I'm so happy to see the cinematic elements really being brought to the forefront in a series like this so that it does feel like a film. And when people are like me and you sit there and you watch all the episodes at one time and you do not even get up for a bathroom break, I want something cinematic. And boy, oh boy, did I get it from you. That's the best. Thank you so much. How challenging is the editing process for the Santa Clauses, especially the way you've upped the ante with story development, character development, and the and comedy with this second season, because you know, comedy's never what, easy anyway to cut. Yes, what's challenging is the schedule. We we get word from Disney Plus that the season is a go, you know, in December, and then. Writing happens in lightning speed, and you know the series is still being rewritten as we're as we're shooting. Mm -hmm. so we really have to go with the flow. The schedule is crazy, given all the restrictions around the kids' hours. And then once we get into post, it's also lightning speed because we have to finish the series with enough time to get all the visual effects done, which take a long time. And then Disney needs a whole lot of time to translate the show into many languages because it drops day and date around the world. So it's, it's, the whole thing is a real race, and that's the challenge. In spite of it only being six episodes, we have three editors, which is a little unusual. Um, but we're able to keep them all on the same page and keep them tonally united because they're, they're editors that I've worked with uh, for many years across different projects. So I know them all very well. They know each other. And, and uh, we kind of function together as a little, uh, little post-production ensemble. Wow. Is it difficult to find the, the comedy beats with this one? Have you... uh, it's, not, it's not hard to find the comedy beats. The, the world is so much fun. And the actors are having so much fun playing these characters that that finding the comedy uh, is not difficult in post, to be honest. It's 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 uh, I mean, it's obviously it always gets better as we go along and mm -hmm. as we try things, um, you know, and, and experiment with things. Actually, it's the action and 
and sort of stakes are more are, are trickier because we're always walking a line in this show between we want the stakes to feel real, we want there to feel like danger, but at the same time, it's for kids and families, so you don't want it to be scary, but it's, it is the stakes and the, 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 the notion that everything could go wrong that, that keeps you watching. So you have to balance that with the comedy and, and also make sure that the payoff feels worthwhile, that by the time we get to the sixth episode, all the fireworks we've been promising are really being set off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this one, as I said earlier, it does go darker than the first season did. I'm going to have to ask you a last question here, Jason, about the fabulous meld. We have the visual, the visuals of that bring us all the nostalgia that we know from the season one and from the Santa Claus movie franchise. We've got a great score happening here that changes things up from what might be a traditional TV scoring. But then you give us these poppy fun needle drops and partying with elves. Yep. What? How do you find, what were you looking for musically so that it would complement your visuals and the story and also even give a little bump up, you know, from the sonic element? Um, well, I'm so glad you mentioned that because... Um uh, we have an incredible composer who is also a world-renowned uh, music producer named Ariel Reichtag, who we brought into the first season because we had this idea that music was going to be a, a, a big part of the series. And he has delivered not just a score that is kind of an extension of the big cinematic score mm -hmm. that was great in the movies so we have borrowed a lot of the tone of that and built on that but into it we've woven lots of christmas carol melodies that that function sort of thematically and that are woven through the score um and then on top of that he produces uh many of the original versions of needle drop songs that that are are in the show and this season uh you know we have uh we have the elves uh singing a, a Billy Idol classic uh, that he produced. Um, and again, that's what I would been, was talking about with music that appeals to the sensibilities of the parents. Um, the kids might not recognize the song, um, uh, but the parents will. And uh, if we're lucky enough to do a third season, we'll have enough original tracks to really release a proper soundtrack oh. for, for three seasons combined. You'll be able to find these tracks out there in the world from this season, but I, my dream is to put it all together and really put out a, 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 a soundtrack of these original songs. Oh, I would love that. But more than that, I want season three now, Jason. I'm ready. Yeah. I'm ready. Well, the show is a, a giant hit for, for, for Disney+. Plus. A season three feels... Uh, uh, it, while, ne while it's never a certainty, it feels it feels uh, like we got a good shot. Well, and if we get a season three, I want another cameo from Bernard. I'm well, just... The truth is, there's so many cameos. <laughs> we actually, we, we have lots of cameos. Oh, I know. From, obviously, <laughs> the, the legendary figures and even, e even um, the Judy the Elf, who's the elf who hands... Um, the, the hot yeah, chocolate, uh, the cocoa. cocoa. In the original movie, we have we tracked her down, and she makes a secret cameo as the proprietor of Judy's hot cocoa stand at Centopolis. So, so we 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 literally bend over backwards to connect our series to the original uh, movies uh, and, and create Easter eggs for the fans. And we have so many cameos, though, and and so many roles, frankly, that we would love. Uh, to make, and hopefully we get to do a, a season three, and we can we can uh, scratch all those itches for the fans. Oh, I would love it, Jason. Thank you, thank you so so much. Thank you for giving me season one and season two, and my fingers and toes are crossed for season three. That is my on my Christmas wish list. Thank you for being such a fan. I, I really appreciate all the positive feedback. And that was Jason Weiner talking about the fun-filled and fabulous. The Santa Claus is season two. So watch it now on Disney Plus. And now 
we move on to another Santa Claus. A perfect casting, as far as I'm concerned, in Danny Glover. Yes, Danny Glover as Santa Claus. And wait until you watch him in The Naughty Nine, which you will also be able to watch on Disney Plus come November 22nd. That's this Wednesday. You can see it on the Disney Channel on Tuesday. So we could have the Battle of the Santas here happen, playing out on Disney Plus this year. Just putting that out there. The Naughty Nine is so much fun. And this really is for all of us out there that seem to make Santa's naughty list and not get what we want at Christmas. The story is fabulous. It's Andy, a troublemaking fifth grader, kind of like a fifth grade version of Ferris Bueller, shall we say. And come Christmas, he doesn't get what he wanted. So he wants the gift that he thinks he should have. So he gets fellow naughty listers to join him to execute an elaborate heist at the North Pole. This is an incredible cast of kids. The movie is written by Jed Elenoff and Scott Thomas. They know kids, they know fun, they know hijinks, they know character. And Alberto Belli, as the director, he comes with a background out of TV, commercials, music videos, and shorts, where he also did his own editing in the case of the music videos and shorts, which directors who were editors, I have found, and you've heard me talk about this in the past, it gives, I think, if you were an editor and you move into the directorial chair, I think it gives you a much keener eye from storytelling because you can and should be editing in your head as you're going. There are several directors I know, be it independent filmmakers or tentpole movies that started at, in editing. Um, and it really helps you, especially when you're talking low budget, no budget, micro budget films and you're time constrained and money constrained. So the more you can envision exactly what you need for a shot, it cuts down on setups and wasting any kind of time for something you may not need. And I think that's one of Alberto's great strengths that he brings to the Naughty Nine. In addition to the fact that you can tell he is a big kid at heart and his joy in directing this film. I mean, it really is a holly jolly holiday film of fun. He, Alberto keeps us in the point of view of the Naughty Nine. We're not vacillating back and forth <clears throat> with different who's, who's who. Do we have this point of view, that point of view? This is the voice of our Naughty Nine. And talk about a great cast. Winslow Fegley, who many of you should have fallen in love with in Lyle Lyle Crocodile last year. Camilla Rodriguez, Derek McCabe, Aiden Elijah, Clara Stack, Madeline Kellum, Imogen Coa, Cohen, Derek Thaler, Anthony Jew, and of, and, and of course, Danny Glover. But keep your eye out on these kids. When you watch this film, follow them because they are going places. And this is where Alberto really embellishes this film because playing upon these perfectly cast kids with very distinct talents and personalities. This is an example of where your costume designer, and he brings in a wonderful costume designer in Julia Caston, who did Bad Moms, Bad Moms Christmas, Celeste and Jesse Forever. Um, the costumes are tailored to the loves and passions and traits of each of these kids because it does involve to get into the North Pole you got to be sneaky so you got to look like an elf even if you don't have pointy ears you got to look like an elf so a lot of that comes down to the costuming 
Julia does an amazing job. Compounding all of this is Anthony Wahlberg's wonderful cinematography. And you're going to hear Alberto and I get into some great detail with the cinematography and the sound design where they are working in tandem in ver a very key scene in the third act of the film. And of course, the editing is crisp, it's sharp, it, it's rapid paced. We get the urgency of the heist. We also feel the tension and the fear. Uh-oh, we're going to get caught. And that's from Evan Algren. And, and Evan, many of you may know his work from Yellowstone in 2018 and 2019. Um, he's got a great editorial pedigree. And to see him now with this family film is just a joy to see what he brings to it. On every level of production, the Naughty Nine is anything but naughty. It's wonderful. So now without any further ado, take a listen to my exclusive interview with director Alberto Belli talking the Naughty Nine. Hi, Hi Alberto. I'm very excited to speak with you about the Naughty Nine. This movie, I described it, I sent, uh, I sent, uh, Amanda and the Rebs, some thoughts on the film. And I said, this is a holly jolly holiday film of fun. I smiled from beginning to end. Your cast is impeccable. The script is so fun. There's adventure. There's friendship. You've got great themes happening. The film looks beautiful. I want to be one of the naughty nine, to be quite honest. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm so so happy that you responded to the movie. We we did it with a lot of love, and and so uh, I'm excited to uh, get it out of the world. So thank you for 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 your nice comment. How did this film find its way to you? It was one of those things that I it was the stars aligned. I've been telling my managers that I love uh, Christmas movies and I love Disney, and somehow you know this script was sent to his desk. And I interviewed for it, and I had just done uh, something for Disney, like uh, a TV show called uh, uh, Ultra Marvel vs. Black Scorpion, and in general it was very light, so that kind of helped me get through the door for that. And I just, you know, it was one of those things, one in a billion coincidence, that I was literally the movie that I was looking for. <laughs> well, it certainly comes across on screen that it's like it was tailor-made for you, Alberto. And it all started, okay. it started with that great script, a script from Jed and Scott. I have admired their work for so long. They have such a knack for comedy. And that really comes through here, which is where your work and with casting was so important. You got these great young actors to step in here and boy, can they do comedy. They are great. been known for their casting kids going all the way back into the 40s and the 50s. They've always had a knack for casting young people from little kids to teens and it really shows here. You couldn't have asked for a better team leader than Winslow Fegley as Andy. He has so he brings so much Ferris Bueller <laughs> to the role. It's great. Mm-hmm. So that was also fun about uh, the casting of this movie. There's like kids from a lot of experience, like Winslow, who had just come from working with Javier Van 
was name. Uh, yeah. On, uh, Leo, I can never pronounce that. Lilo Lilo Cocker, Crocodile. Lilo Lilo uh, Crocodile. Yes, indeed. And then there was all the kids who have never been on set. Like, it was literally the first movie they've been locked, you know, on COVID for like three years by the time we started doing the movie. So it was, it was very, very fun to see all kinds of uh, different kids and their experiences. Well, what's really interesting, and this goes to the script and the writing, but also in your visual design and how you visually approached this and worked with your young actors, because each one has a different trait, and I really love that. We have one fashion designer. We have another one that knows how to pull out those cute, sad eyes and make everybody feel sorry for him. You've got an animal whisperer. You've got a gymnast. You have somebody who excels at motorcycle, motocross. You've got just a good kid who is the spirit of Christmas, and he just wants to see the North Pole and Santa. You really celebrate the dreams of all of these kids and their talents. And I really love that because there is something for every kid that's going to watch this film. They will be able to identify with one, if not more, of these characters. Yeah, like that was, that was also like the great thing, you know, again, giving credit to Jen and Scott, who are brilliant. Like, I think they were able to establish very specific traits for, for each kid, like you mentioned. So it was uh, fun bringing those characters to life without making it stereotypical in a way because it could, you know, go on that ride. But, like, I feel we just found the kids who fell naturally into those roles. And uh, and like you said, like, I think there's a little bit maybe of each of those characters in, in, in each of us. Oh, absolutely. Now, talk to me about working with your cinematographer, with Anthony Wahlberg. I'm a huge admirer of Anthony's work. But primarily what I've seen for, from him are dramas, this is so different than most of what I've seen uh, uh, from him in terms of lighting and lensing. So I'm really curious about what you were looking for, what you wanted your visual grammar to be to match the frivolity and the fun that the kids were having. Yeah, I mean, you know, I think uh, what Anthony brought, which I really like, we always wanted to make... Uh, the North Pole be kind of like magical, but always very grounded. Um, that was always the thought behind it. It was like, you know, the North Pole in theory, Santa has been with us forever. So where he lived needed to have that sense of style. So that's the reason I think uh, Anthony was a great fit because he was able to make it magically grounded. And a very um, important answer was also like the night. We wanted to make sure that we could see the night because a lot of lately a lot of movies and tv shows tend to make like the night so dark and i'm yeah. like i don't remember those you know the night being like so dark in those movies so we went like really on the 80s kind of like Spielberg and the goonies and all those movies were like the night were like lit properly and blue so we played a lot with that um and then yeah i think i think again anthony brought that like realism that i think balance out like the story this begs the question you bring up the north pole which is magical just looking at the wide shots the aerial shots and then when we're on the ground how much of that was actually a physical set how much did nicholas lepage actually and his set decorating team actually design or did that get cgi'd in at some point a lot of the village mm -hmm. um, in, a, in Montreal. We basically built a plaza in a long street because we needed to do all the stone, uh, stones for the chase and all that stuff so we could reuse it. You know, like we basically, it was like one long street that we keep like redressing or changing stuff to make it look like a new street. And the plaza was for, uh, you know, where the sun, Santa Statue is, we needed to be able to go around and around and around. And also the exterior of the wall, like, uh, of the gate, that was practical. Of course, you know, everything behind it is not. But right. I would say, I don't know, like 50% is practical. Same with, like, the ice cavern. It was all, um, most of it was, like, actual build. Mm -hmm. It was really good for the kids, you know? Like, you just step into those sets and you felt it was magical around it. And uh, that was also something very important for me. I was, 
like, again, going back to the movies that I grew up with, I was like, oh, I think we need that realism. Uh, even if they're imperfect, I think that's the beauty of, of uh, movie making. Oh, absolutely. And of course, especially when you're dealing with kid actors, their imaginations really get fueled and enhanced if you put them into an ice cave or you put them into a castle. I think that really ups the ante with their acting skills as well because they really experience the wonder of what they're seeing and doing. Totally, yes. Now, I've got, I have to ask you about Danny Glover as Santa. God, he is so perfect as Santa. But something that you and Anthony do and you and your sound people do in the third act with Santa meeting with the Naughty Nine, you and Anthony, you actually have the camera dutching up to Santa so that he always comes across as this larger-than-life, imposing figure as he's up at his desk and you've got Andy down on the, on the, standing on the ground. So you can get that sense of power and who has control at this moment. And it's not Andy. It's not Andy. So I love that you do that. But then you take it a step further with your sound design and your sound people. So that while Santa is talking to Andy and then to the Naughty Nine, we're getting almost like a slight reverb so that Danny Glover's voice fills the whole room. Yet when the kids talk, it's just a normal little conversational level. And I love that distinction within the sound because it really gives that omnipresent sense to Santa. Was this something you guys talked about? Was it something that came up in the editing process? Because I just think that marriage between the camera dutching and that sound of Santa speaking is so perfect. Absolutely. The minute I heard him speak in not, you know, when his back was still to us by his fireplace and his feet are up, we haven't seen his face yet. But once he gets into the into the throne room to meet with Andy and then the rest of the Naughty Nine, that was perfection. I was so thrilled to see and hear what you did with that scene that just impeccable filmmaking impeccable the editing editing with comedy is always tough you've got comedy you've got action you have some moments of gravitas now your editor evan algren i love his work but everything that he does is really very serious yellowstone fortress sniper's eye which is like razor sharp action the Institute, which is creepy. He's an interesting choice for the Naughty Nine. So I'm curious about you, your work with Evan on the editing of this film. It was, I actually was like so fun and a blast. I usually uh, have a hard time editing uh, because sometimes I usually edit my own stuff, like commercials and, and other stuff I've, I've done. So I, ha I always have like trouble finding the perfect guy, but I think Evan like really was able to understand stories first and I think that's the most important thing for me for for, for an editor to have like even if his other stuff was like you mentioned uh, very uh, different I guess in tone yeah he the right person he really understood story and he understood what was the point of every every scene and you know like the actors are already kind of like delivering the comment and it was more about how do you make uh, make it come even more alive but I think to Evan's credit it was always 
course he knew what was the point of every every story and then we also needed someone who could cut action which was there's not a lot of people who can do uh, action really uh, that uh, that we that we're meeting so he was like really good at like he had everything I guess like story but again story 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 and he was uh, we felt that he was like the perfect choice because he, he understood the story more than I think and then he also just became a dad and I think that was an exciting thing for everyone I'm also a dad so we're, we're you put like that extra love because they're like oh my kids are gonna love this so <laughs> I would be remiss not to ask you about your incredible costume designer, Julia Caston. These are the most fun costumes I have seen Julia do for any film that she's done. She's the one, obviously, that designed all of John Anthony's elf designs. Mm -hmm. They are fabulous! What were you looking for? In terms of that costume, I mean, the rest of, of the wardrobe, it's like, yeah, it's, it's typical, it's kids, they're fifth graders, this is how they look. But yeah. then they get, John Anthony has to come up with these gorgeous designs, red and green, sticking with the theme of the North Pole, trying to blend in his elves. Of course, much better dressed elves than the real elves. Yeah. But what kind of conversations did you have with Julia as to how you wanted those costumes to stand out and pop. I mean, Julia was, like you said, like, amazing. Like, every time I, I went, it was, like, my favorite time going to visit her, uh, her, um, what is it called, workshop. It was, like, so full of color, and it was beautiful and perfect. Um, and we heard a lot of it, a lot of it was, I mean, when I read the script, really, like, the, the, the first time you would think, like, oh, you know, they dress as elves, and I was like, ah, you know, if it was, like, a high-end fashion designer, he wouldn't do, like, mole, uh, the typical mole like right. L. So even <laughs> my first pitch for these, I was like, I think we need to make them, like, modern and cool and high-end and with a little personality of each of the kids. Yep. And I think you took that idea and take it farther with, like, the beautiful, like, the hats. Like, if you saw them, like, in, in person, you will, like, feel them. They were so cool. Um, and then she just added so much personality, you know, like, she just really, it's one of those beautiful things about filmmaking where you just have, like, this idea and the person that really knows the, her craft, like, takes it or he's, like, takes it to another level, and I think that was, like, definitely Julia, like, she just, I love everything about it, and then, uh, and the same thing with, like, the elves, like, she had, like, uh, dress, I think, with, like, 150 or 200 elves that she needed to dress for the party, and again, we really wanted to make this Norpol be inclusive and have different cultures so she put little details here and there of every uh actor uh, ethnicity and it was it was such a beautiful work i, I feel very uh lucky we we got to work with her yeah the party scene is great but what i love about the costume the elf costumes for the naughty nine is as you say you can see her put in the personality of each character you know, obviously, John Anthony's costume is going to be over the top. He is the fashion designer. We've got Rose, who's so shy, and the animal whisper. She's got, like, a, a quiet kind of, of tone to her. Laurel, she's wearing this beautiful, bedazzled and sequined gymnast uh, unitard that is gorgeous. Similarly with Hyun, it looks like she is ready to go take off on a snowmobile as a racer. So everything really fits the character traits. And I was so impressed watching that and seeing that because if the kids aren't wearing those costumes, they are so perfect. I can I could look at a costume and tell you which character it belonged on. That's how good a, do a job she did. Yeah, she, she was truly amazing. Hopefully, my dream has always been to have Halloween costumes based on a movie that I did, maybe next, next year. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's a great idea, Alberto. So, one more element of this film. No Christmas movie is complete without music. You got a great composer here, Kenny Wood. One of Kenny's greatest strengths is his work as a musical arranger on so many different scores. He understands arrangement and instrumentation. And the film isn't filled with wall-to-wall -wall Christmas songs. 
There's original score here, and then it's punctuated, and some of it comes with the instrumentation. So I'm curious about what you were looking for musically to complement the visuals and the story. Kenny, Kenny and I met uh, in film school, actually. So we've been working for, you know, he's done most of the work that I've done. So I was very excited I was able to bring him to this. And I think he just understands that when the music needs to be, you know, small and emotional and what needs to be big, right? Like when we go to uh, the normal, how, how it becomes, and also like themes. Like I, I do miss a lot of the scores right now are like most like what I call like ambient. Mm -hmm. uh, right, you know, like they work in, in certain movies, but I really wanted to have like, oh, you know, like when you play this, this is like the Naughty Night theme. And I think he really uh, took that idea and then created like the theme from the Naughty Night and the theme from, you know, um, and his relationship with his sister, and he was able to create all these things that uh, I was so happy with. Uh, and then, yeah, like I, I just think he speaks the same. If I was like, like my dream, I would say I became like a filmmaker because I love scores so much, and that's the reason I basically hear scores all the time. And I think I got very lucky with Kenny. It's like he, if I was a composer, I would write like him, uh, and so he he understands that. I love the different motifs that he came up with for certain characters and for the relationships between a couple of characters. Andy and Laurel, there is a distinct motif that pops up again a couple times with them. And of course, Dulce and Andy. They really do have their own BFF kind of music motif going throughout the, the film. And it's just, on every level, Alberto, you have done such an amazing job so now I'm curious, I've got one last question for you. What did you learn about yourself as a filmmaker making The Naughty Nine? Your first Christmas movie, which means that it's going to be on repeat every year from now until the end of time. So you got your first Christmas movie, feature film, you're working with all these kids, you're working with reindeer, you know, what did you learn about yourself as a filmmaker that you can now take forward into your future projects? That's like actually a really good question. I think, I think, I mean, I came very, I, I guess like I became like a more confident filmmaker because, you know, when you're starting, you just tell you like, don't work with kids, don't work at night, don't work in animals, don't do stones. So this movie literally has everything at once. And I feel, um, uh, you know, I was, I, I was able to learn how to manage all these challenges and, and still uh, deliver something. And another thing was, like, I, I used to be a compu computer science engineer, and I always loved VFX. Mm -hmm. So, it, it was, again, like a dream come true to be able to do those big, big visual effect shots, because I always thought, like, you know, I think I can make them, but until you have the actual budget to try to make them. Um, so I also learned that, like, I think uh, I definitely feel that I can deal with VFX uh, very well uh, now that I had all this experience as before. But, like, you know, it, they cost so much money on, like, you know, you can do a short film with, like, two people in a room and, you know, you can, you know, get the actors to perform and, and the, the camera and all that stuff. But, like, until you ha actually have, like, a bigger budget movie, you never know if you, you'll be able to deliver with the VFX. So I, I was very um, happy that they, how it came out. And then I feel, again, more confident. I'm like, yes, I, I, I can deliver that kind of movie that I always dream to do, to be honest. So am I getting a sequel? Oh, I hope so. I, I don't know. Uh, you know, the minute this one ended, I'm like sitting here and yelling. Oh my God, a sequel, a sequel! Oh, I bet you're like, I, I hope so. I mean, the kids have grown, so we would have to, you know, get a little bit creative. How do we keep the, the momentum with the kids a little bit grow? Especially Winslow. I mean, if we knock on wood, then I don't know if it's going to happen. Have like a premiere or something. Yeah, he's, he's like grown, so so much, so it will be interesting to see how we can take that idea and make it uh, fresh. Well, he could mentor a new group of Naughty Nine. Santa told him, I need your help, so he could turn into a mentor, even if he is now 17 years old. Yeah, sure. Uh, that's a good idea, yeah. Alberto, this has been so wonderful getting to talk with you about the Naughty Nine. I love this film so much, and I love your work, and I can't wait to see what you bring me next. Oh, thank you, Debbie. Uh, it was such a pleasure, and, and I appreciate, like, you're such a good interviewer, plus you really understand the craft. So, you know, when I was reading and hearing all the podcasts, I was like, oh, wow, she, you know, it's, it's going to be... <laughs>
going to be so exciting because you you get deep into the crowd but always, you know, making it accessible. So I, I, I appreciate uh, this interview so much. Oh, well, thank you. And I hope we get to chat again in the future. Yes, for sure. Thank you, baby. <laughs> Thanks, Alberto. Bye-bye. And that was Alberto Belli, director of the Holly Jolly Holiday Film of Fun, The Naughty Nine. It is on Disney Plus on Wednesday the 22nd. If you have Disney Channel, you can see it early on Tuesday the 21st. The Santa Clauses, Season 2, currently on Disney Plus. And if you need to get caught up, Season 1 is there too. So, as I said, I think we could have the Battle of the Santas happening on Disney Plus this holiday season. This is all the time we have for this show. We will be back on Monday, December 4th. I had already planned for November 27th to be dark, the Monday after Thanksgiving, only because I'll probably still be in a tryptophan coma from eating an 18-pound turkey over the weekend. But come December 4th, jam-packed show, December 11th, jam-packed. December 18th, the last show of 2023, jam-packed. And then hopefully we will be back in January to kick off year 10 of Behind the Lens. Can you believe it? But for right now, in the interim, if you need more Behind the Lens, go to BehindTheLensOnline.net for re movie reviews, interviews, trailers. Uh, check out the archival materials with all of the TCM Film Festival red carpet interviews. Um, there's oodles of stuff on the website for you to check out. That's my pitch for today. So until December 4th, I'm Debbie Elias. This is Behind the Lens.